at the end of the day, if you're looking to really sell your company, let's make sure you have the right information. And I want a good show, damn it. Great freaking show. You went awesome, yeah. I'm excited <laughs> to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Yes. Welcome to another episode of the Ecom Show. I'm your host, Andrew Math, and today I am joined by the amazing Chris Shipperling. That's right. I, I got it. Uh, founding partner over at GW Partners. Uh, Chris, how you doing, man? You ready for a good show? I'm doing good, man. I am. Uh, I'm. I've got my water, and I'm ready. I'm ready to rock, dude. <laughs> Beautiful. I know we were uh, chatting beforehand. You're on like a podcast run today, so I'm. I'm glad I got you after you got like the first practice podcast in. Yeah, that's right, man. That's right. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm primed and I'm ready to actually talk about the the the, the real meat and guts of D to C. <laughs> Beautiful. So let's uh, let's do the stereotypical thing. Let's pretend no one knows who you are. No one knows anything yeah. about GW Partners. Let's start high level real quick. Why don't you give yeah. us a little bit of insight into yourself, GW, and we'll go from there, okay? Yeah, absolutely. So look, high level, we sell we sell businesses. That's what we do. I know if, you know, you hit me with with one, give me one sentence, that's it. But our approach is we like to get involved as early as possible because we can help affect the outcome. And mm -hmm. so what does that look like? It's it's a phased approach leading towards an M&A event. And so we get involved with pretty much every facet, every function of the company by both doing a, a deep analysis, then helping the founder owner when it comes to execution through strategic resources and through strategic thinking and planning. And then we move the company towards the owner founder goals, right? That's the really the thing that drives. That's the that's the North Star, as marketing folks love to say. It's and 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 we're we're guiding everything towards that because we've got to get the company to a place where the market is going to agree with the goal. That's really what we're doing. So high level, that's what we do. My background has always been in, um, I've been in consumer products pretty much since, uh, you know, gosh, 2003. Started off in the baby product space, worked there as a sales and marketing executive for various companies, w was working with Amazon when they were a still considered a bookseller. Uh, and they started to venture out into uh, being more of a, a stronger retailer. Worked with CSN stores, which turned into Wayfair. Worked with, um, oh gosh, diapers.com when they were in a small little tiny house in New Jersey. And now I'm starting to feel like a grandpa of e-commerce, but- You're dating yourself. <laughs> I am, man. So I really worked in, worked in, uh, in consumer products. E I saw e-tail like, really start to take off. That's really where I'm going. And I was working with a Spanish-based uh, brand um, running North America for them when I got just sick and tired of a buyer's opinion. And I said, there is a way better way to reach the consumer, in my opinion, right now. And that is going directly to them and having the conversation. Yeah. So I learned Amazon, uh, taking a widget, putting it through you know, the wash. That was like really good training wheels as then you start to venture out and you learn the mechanics of Google advertising and meta. Well, that wasn't meta then, but meta, um, yeah. SEO, email marketing, you know, training wheels were off with Amazon. And that to me was really starting to become uh, the harder uh, acquisition channels to understand. And D2C was definitely a very challenging sales channel, but highly mm -hmm. rewarding, especially at the time. This is 2016, 17. Um, so I started my own company where I... Um, I helped, I, I, I consulted with brands really in the baby space. A lot of them were my friends to formulate digital strategy because, you know, a lot of brands back then, even now are so heavily weighted towards what they know the best that's selling to Walmart, that's selling to target and consumer products. And so, um, then I met up with some, where I'm, I'm in Charlotte, man. So investment banking town. So I met up with some investment bankers yeah. and we said, Hey, there's a much better way than a business broker process to sell a you know lower middle market e-commerce business or a direct-to-consumer consumer products business and so uh 
yeah, we we started um, our a, a, a version of our firm <laughs> back in 2018. Since then, we've evolved. You know, we we grew to lots of employees, and then had an unfortunate event happen with one partner, myself, and my current business partner. We just stepped away completely, and we have started our own effort. Everything that I just said in the beginning, which is we sell businesses, but we really get in, we dig in as early as we can to help optimize that sale. We're we're the insurance policy, so you leave no money on the table, man. <laughs> nice. So how how does it work? Is it like uh, you know, there's a certain type of client you work with, and or I'm sorry, a certain type of brand you work with, and you your services are like part of the equity you get, or is it like an investment situation? Is it like a straight up just you acquire them, build it, and get rid of it? Like how did what's that process like? Yeah, the process. So um, it, it, I don't want to confuse your listeners. We do have a growth fund where everything I'm about to say is um, pretty much the same, but we take equity, but I don't want to confuse mm-hmm. listeners. Let's, I'll focus on GW Partners uh, because that growth fund is with, it's a joint venture with Sellers Funding and, or Sellers Fi and also a Scala and Multiply Me. Um, so that's all, it's, it's called South Call. It's a whole other separate thing. We can leave it in the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For GW Partners, um, yeah, we are, we, are, we are a service provider taking retainers. Um, through the phases. So we have fa- we have four phases effectively. Phase one is our analysis that takes two months. We've got to get to know your company. We've got to get to know your data. I can't take your word for it, unfortunately. I've got to really dig in and see, are there any gremlins anywhere? And effectively mm-hmm. what we do through all the functions, uh, with each function, we do a SWOT analysis. We, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We got to understand where is the company. And then from there, we create a just a laundry list of things that need to change just to make it very simple. It's our recommendations for what happens next. That's our execution phase. So in execution phase, I'm rolling up my sleeves and I'm getting them very dirty with you. I'm working side by side to um, Jim Collins, the hell out of the company, right? Wrong people off the <laughs> bus, right people on the bus and right people, right seats. That's just not employees. That's real service providers. And again, we're driving the bus towards goal. Right. Yeah. You told me I need 30 million for the company. You're at 10 million. Well, mm, it's a long, it's a longer bus ride, but let's do it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you may have just explored D to C and you have zero. By the way, this is, this is very much our client base. No Amazon effort or just didn't care about Amazon, no other marketplaces and no real strategy or thought for retail, but they've yeah. got a nice product. They've been able to sell it really well to, you know, directly to the consumer through their website. And now they're stressed out about CAC <laughs> and, uh, and they're starting to think about ways to, okay, how, how do I move away from just direct to consumer? And that also with new sales channels brings more revenue to, to reach the goals. But so that's what it looks like. And we're taking retainers all the way through phase three is more of a maintenance phase where I'm an, av- we're advisors to you at that point. We've gotten to know mm-hmm. each other because we were in the foxhole together and we were in the trenches. And so you really yeah. trust our advice at this point. And we're, we're actually taking a few steps back to start thinking about how we're going to sell the company. What's the strategy for the process? And we're really doing a lot of research and uh, information digging on, okay, who's the right fit for this? We're starting to have anonymous whisper conversations with private equity that we know very well um, within the you know particular category. And then phase four is we've built the deck you know, we've got all of our marketing material materials, we've done our quality of earnings, we've done our diligence, and now we're actively pursuing an auction for the company um, to then drive towards an LOI, then a closing, and then everybody is very happy <laughs> because <laughs> it, there's been a closing. So, I was into that. so we take retainers, but what we do, this is really important, we credit all of our all of the retainer money to our success fee. So mm-hmm. once the business has been sold, that goes on as a, as a credit, um, to, oh, to nice. the, yeah, to the success fee, because to us, it's not about taking retainer fees. We do that because we can't, we can't afford to have a negative ledger running all the way through. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's really where, uh, but, but, but for us, we're, we're aligned with the business owner on selling the business. Yeah. Oh. Nice. So you brought up CAC, which I actually find it's one of like the unspoken things in DTC of like everyone thinks they know how to formulate their CAC and then everyone's answer is different. Yeah. So how are you, when you sit down with these brands, how are you actually coming up with what their actual 
customer acquisition cost is? How what what expenses are you filtering into that? Yeah, I mean, look, we're so intimate with the finances. That's that's the advantage we have. So yeah. we, we can we can basically say we can sit down and say to you, how do you want to formulate this? Because at the end of the day, we know the PL extremely well. So mm-hmm. typically the way that we're approaching CAC is like total TCAC. Um, it is client by client, but just to kind of generalize it, we're not usually including like salaries of the people who are working on it. Um, that's typically not like to us, that's fixed costs. Like yeah. we're really trying to understand from a more pure sense, like every single, every single dollar that's spent through any acquisition channel, whether that's even down to seriously, like how much did it cost to ship the product to these influencers? Like we've got to understand what all the fully, fully baked costs are that mm-hmm. are, are, are truly purely attributed towards I'm going to acquire the consumer, but no man, like overhead, like we have already an allocation of overhead that we've done as, as far as a percentage. So like when we're creating unit economics for an Amazon or for D to C or for a new retail channel, like we've already got a percentage of overhead. We're going to allocate to that because we've done just a body of work to get to a place where we really understand the finances. But the TCAC for us is, is what I just said. It's really any dollar that's really going towards outside of human capital or humans working on the business. That's, that's what we're attributing because we've got, and then we start to really get very granular, obviously in attribution in, in specific acquisition channels, like what's the attribution and what's the CAC for each channel et cetera, et cetera. So. Got it. It was sick. Cause I I've spoken with so many sellers and it's, it, I don't know if anyone does it the same. I think they all have their own way of, of factoring CAC. And when you're trying to map that out, it always becomes such a challenge. Uh, yeah. so you, the, the brands you work with, are they primarily of a certain size? Oh, it looks like you went mute by the way, man. I can't hear you. <sighs> This is why I shouldn't have my mouse over the mute button and then hit it. Jeez. I heard, I heard the brand. Sorry, this is my first <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. I was going to do it in the chat. God. <laughs> Thank God for editing, man. Thank God. Ay, ay, ay. Um, screw it. Leave it in. We're all real. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. So the question was, God, um, <laughs> The brands you work with, uh, you yeah. know, you mentioned Amazon sellers, you know, your D to C. Are are there certain sizes you work with? Are there certain categories, certain business models? Like, what's that look like? One hundred percent. We typically work with sizes, uh, you know, around five to seven million. A lot of times, the owner has you know enough cash flow to start thinking. First off, their business is typically at an inflection point at that point, right? You work with mm-hmm. a lot of D to C brands. You work with a lot of brands, and you know that once they hit about that five to seven to ten million, depending on their economics they're really at a nice growth inflection where they're at a point where they're yeah. saying, Hey, I've got a lot of cash flow. I want to put it more. I want to put it into the business. Andrew, tell me what to do with this to go acquire more consumers. Right. Yeah. And so that also lends itself to a couple things. They've got a view of, I want to exit in two years, a year, three years, whatever. Um, so that's why that revenue mark, is a really good fit for us because by the time we take the business to market, we want them to be at least 15 million, 20 million, 25, 30, 35, because that has enough market share and gains enough interest from a wider pool of buyers. The smaller you are, you just shrink your buyer, your buyer base, who's going to pay a lot of money. That's all the owner founder cares about. That's it. Right. And so, you know, you've got a lot of buyers like, if you got a one, two, $3 million business and you put it on biz by sell and you do use a broker and they use SBA and all that kind of good stuff. Like, yeah, you've got a big pool down there, but you're, you're going through SBA, man. You're only going to get a three multiple because the, the guy might say, Hey, I'll, uh, you might demand someone to pay a seven multiple. And they're like, yeah, I will. And then it goes through the bank underwriting process and their own evaluate, you know, valuation and, and appraisal and the appraisal comes back and says, sorry, the business is only worth a two multiple. Well, yeah. okay. Yeah. You get my point when you're talking to sophisticated capital, you know, you at, at that size, you start to become interesting to them. And of course, the more interesting and attractive you are, the more they're, you're going to magnetize that multiple up for sure. Yeah. So 
Yeah, long way to answer. That's that's kind of who we work with. As far as who, you know, we're fairly category agnostic. However, there are a couple categories we we had just have more of an affinity towards than others. It's probably a lot like you and your business. It just kind of happened that way. I came from yeah. baby products and toy, man. So we work with a lot of baby product companies just because yeah. they hear my background. They're like, oh, this is awesome. Like you get the industry. Yeah, really, you guys really got to awesome. find that common ground. And you're sold. You do. And also... <laughs> And that's why we also focus on consumer products because when people, when they talk to us, they go, oh, you really get, you really understand consumer products very well. We don't sell agencies. We don't, we've done one SaaS deal. That's, that's, we'll never do that again. We don't, <laughs> we know our lane very well and it's consumer product companies. You know, now there are a few, and we don't really like supplements. Those are hard to sell. Those are hard mm -hmm. to do a lot with. It's a lot of, it's hard a lot market. of Amazon and it's a <laughs> A lot of hacks. It's a lot of tactician stuff. There's not a ton of strategy behind it. So yeah. really in supplements, man, you're just trying to build, you're just trying to build the next Goliath. So the other Goliath that's bigger than you wants to buy you for your market share. That's really all yeah. you're doing. And then um, consumer electronics just suck. Man. <laughs> just, <laughs> the margins are so bad. They're just so yeah. So slim, and it's just. I talked to a guy once. He was a reseller, so I mean, we don't touch resellers at all. But we talked to him. This is like five years ago. My man was doing a hundred million through Amazon, nine hundred thousand in profit, ten million sitting on his balance sheet for inventory. I'm like, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night, dude. <laughs> oh <my laughs> like that God. is that is uh, a. It's impressive that you've got that much inventory and that little profit. That's actually impressive. Um, but that's, <laughs> that's because the dude is doing a hundred million, <laughs> but if someone actually really cared about his company, they would pay him like three mil of goodwill. And then they would create like a five year best buy type of no interest payment plan on the inventory. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it just, it's just, that's just, that's just doesn't sell. So just to give some examples of things that there's are harder. Yeah. On. So it's probably just like you, I mean, you're, you're going to get granular on certain categories. Cause you're like, sorry, man, just like trying to work in this category is not easy. Yeah. It's, supplements are a nightmare to market. You know, there's so many rules. Uh, we do for whatever reason, I don't even know how we got into this, but we do a lot of like restricted brand stuff, right? Like, like CBD, That's THC, cool. like it's fun and it's, it's great to see them grow because the margins are great, but the, the, the scaling of it is a nightmare because it's all content creation. You've got rules you've got to follow of advertising, all that fun stuff. Um, but I digress. So the uh, let's talk about as much as you're willing to tell me without forcing me to pay your retainer just for this episode. <laughs> how, uh, like, what's the thought process on how you start to scale things? I have a very strong opinion about people that are solely on Amazon. I think that it's kind of respectfully dumb and they can exit for a significantly higher multiple if they could diversify and own their own yeah. data and all that fun stuff. But like, what's... What's your approach? What's your stance? And I know every business is different, but if you've got yeah. any kind of generalities, oh, no, you're you're nailing you're nailing it right on the head, dude. I mean, number one, the reason why Amazon businesses went up is because it's the same reason Dogecoin went up, right? There really isn't a whole lot behind it, but because Elon Musk said Doge and how much he loves it, and again, I know there's people who own Doge and they probably would. They, they would argue with me till the cows come home on how great the project actually is and blah, 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 blah. My point is you had someone screaming, carnival barking about it, and all of a sudden the value went up. Well, very similar. We had our, our very similar carnival barkers called aggregators that came in all at one time, only wanting Amazon businesses, and it drove up the value. Prior mm -hmm. to that, an Amazon business was extremely hard to sell. And if you found a buyer, getting it to underwrite through the SBA process was extremely hard. And private equity was like not touching it for a lot of reasons. And that's why the aggregators actually saw a white space with it. Because they were like, well, big capital doesn't want to touch this. And we can get involved. And we're finance bros. And we're smarter than the digital marketing bros. And we know more than them because we're smarter. And we went to Harvard. And so we're going to come in and do all these things and we're going to blah, blah, blah. And what they failed to realize is what everyone has already realized, which is scale, economies of scale with, with 10 different Amazon brands is not a thing ever, period. It's so siloed. Mm -hmm. It's not a thing. It's very difficult to wrap and scale them together. 
right? Yeah. The only place you get any type of economies of, of um, any type of economy period, um, you know, tailwind is if you happen to find the same, like one manufacturer can build more of more products for you. And yeah. So you're negotiating effectively raw material at that point. That's not a comp that's not a business I want to be involved in. So yeah. Anyways, long story short, yes, no, all Amazon business, and most of the time you'll agree with me because you're in the space. That company that's all Amazon, there's a reason why they're not off Amazon yet. It's because yeah. they're so commoditized or their AOV is so low, their CAC and AOV and LTV, those economics will never work off Amazon ever. Mm -hmm. And so you're staring at something that you're just basically saying, okay, this is now a devalued asset. I could go out and maybe get three multiple for it because I've got a corporate banker who just left his job and he just wants some steady salary and income. So I'm going to get, yeah, like two and a half, maybe three multiple. That's why the aggregators have gone back to two and a half. I talked to an aggregator the other day, or I wouldn't say the other day, but it was like three months ago. And it made me laugh. I actually had to hold back laughing because he was like, look, we're paying, we're paying three multiple, man, like three, three and a half multiple. And if it's a really great business of really good size and really diversification, we'll pay up to like five. And I'm like, do you have any clue what a PE fund, even in this bad market, will pay for a very good business of what you just described? Yeah, that sucker is getting done at least seven to nine multiple with a lot of great candy for the owner. Like, <laughs> it's just so like, oh my gosh. So anyways, yes, you have to diversify. And mainly you have to be able to prove that, A, you're in consumer products, man. You've got to have great product. I preach this on every single podcast that I go on. If you don't, that's yeah. really where we, we actually spend a lot of time with founder owners on product development because unfortunately it tends to be more of a weakness. They've created something good, but they haven't created a plan for, for the next mm -hmm. years. And when you talk to, I just talked to somebody yesterday who, you know, w worked as an executive of L'Oreal and, and Haynes, and I could go on the list of this resume from this person I spoke to. And they're actually, they're on their own doing a lot of consulting. And one of the things they're doing is three-year product roadmaps. It matters in consumer products, man. Like anywhere you go, I worked, I used to work with a lot of PNG guys. That's all we talked about was three-year roadmaps. So anyways, that's, that's where you have to, you have to have great product. It has to be able to sell in lots of different sales channels and acquisition channels. And you become highly attractive, 100%. Yeah. It's My argument too is always like it, it. I'd imagine, and obviously, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it severely opens up your buyer pool because if you're solely selling on Amazon, like I always use this analogy, and I don't know why because I don't really fish or hunt, but it is the way I always do this. Like if I had a if I had a business and I was just selling on Amazon and I sold a ton of fishing products, the only company that's going to be interested in buying me is just someone who wants to probably benefit from you know processes, obviously the profit coming in some pre-existing like advertising data I have and then whatever I've got from like an inventory like manufacturing side of things, but then that's it. But if I'm diversified and I've got my own site and I have my own list, I have, you know, traffic coming in, I've got people getting pixeled, I've got all this extra data that I have to leverage, all of a sudden now a company that sells hunting gear could be interested in, in buying me because they might be able to sell their product to the, the existing audience I already have. So doesn't that kind of like by having your own D2C site, even if you're on the other channels, I'm not saying like no one should be on the marketplaces, but I find the marketplaces are better from a customer acquisition side. And then you should actually be focused on building the brand and your own D2C side because that will make you more valuable in the exit. Am I close? Yes, you are. I mean, I think I think most of what you said is very, very true. And there's a lot of nuance in there, per se, but everything you said was very true. And I mean, that's also the, the 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 ability to build community, by the way, is going to become a very big topic in the next two or three years, especially yeah. when you've got AI pretty much about to, I think, obliterate the SEO space. FYI, I think building you out. Think? Uh, yeah, I do. You think like, the average person's going to start using like I've so like my father in law is like one of those guys who won't have like a Google or an Alexa in his house because he thinks it's listening to him at all times. Yeah. So I'm I'm like those types of guys. Yeah, I don't see being like, oh, let me just ask this robot personal questions and see if it works. Like you think like middle America is going to accept the AI that it'll actually just 
knock SEO out in the next couple of years? Uh, dude. So I don't know enough to have a, to give you a very intelligent answer where it's coming from is my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law is a huge SEO guy. It has been since 2001. And he actually worked on CNET. Like he, he's worked in like, he's actually worked in some pretty astute SEO environments. He's the one who texted me two days ago, like this huge provocative thing. It's going to be dead in the next two years. And then he proceeded to write a novel of why. Um, I will send you, he's about to, he's about to do a whole series of videos and, and I'll send them to you because you All want right. to, <laughs> yeah, um, and I've, I've been meaning to call him just because I want to dig in on, on that a lot more, but you know, brand, brand building, community building, that's going to be, that's because I think where he was coming from mainly was just the fact that AI really is just writing all the content now. And so yeah. I, I don't know if he was meaning like SEO is dead or it's just as an industry, something where you can actually like make money off of SEO. Um, oh, yeah. I think that's more where he was going. Um, and so, but, you know, relevant to what we were just talking about, brands now focusing on really trying to build that community is highly valuable. I mean, you've got nuance. People will argue um, oh, the cosmetics company that was sold to Church and Dwight not too long ago for like 600 million. They were, mm -hmm. they started as an Amazon business, but then, and people will point and say, see, that's an Amazon business. And I'm like, the reason why Church and Dwight actually gave a, a rat's rear end is because they were able to leave Amazon and sell in many different channels. And then they yeah. point to Zesty Paws and I'm like, same damn thing, dude. Then mm -hmm. you can actually point to Dude Wipes where, you know, Sean, I think his name is Wiley or Riley. Um, the owner of Dude Wipes, he'll say, mm -hmm. hey, look, man, Amazon is like, don't knock Amazon. That's our biggest acquisition, our sales channel. And I'm like, that makes sense. That in grocery, because like when I'm thinking about a product like his, which is really just well-marketed baby wipes, yeah, diapers, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I, I, I want to buy that and have it come to me. I'm going to put it on subscribe and save if it's something I'm using all the time. So, I mean, his product is kind of lends itself to more being commodity. He's just really damn good at marketing. And oh, by the way, yeah. he's also commanded a shit ton, pardon my French, a ton of market share. I mean, he's done oh, a yeah. phenomenal job. So someone like him, that's my nuance. Someone like him will sell for a lot of money, even the majority of his sales are coming from Amazon. Yeah. Just because of everything else I just said. So, oh yeah, I mean, I know it's all. It's going to almost always be a majority of sales, especially as you mentioned, you know, if the, if the brand's a commodity. But I still think that even if that's the case, the margin that they're getting on that, it's really just better from a customer acquisition standpoint. So if your branding is in a good spot and you've got the necessary, you know, bells and whistles in place, then getting them to diversify and purchase from you in store or on your own website or yes. setting up a subscribe and save on your site, that's a lot more beneficial. I like Amazon as a customer acquisition channel. Yes, I find it very hard to really justify anyone doing well on there because if you have a high enough AOV and your margins are, are decent enough, the problem is, is that most people aren't shopping for things like that on Amazon unless you've built a brand off Amazon and then you just have the search volume for your own brand name on Amazon. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, Amazon too, Amazon too, it could, there's a couple of things I want to address what you just said. You are right. So majority of, of how you approach building something highly valuable is exactly what you said. The, there are a few exceptions, but the, even the exceptions, that was my point. They have massive nuance to them. And you yeah. can't, people can't point to them as a case study, as an argument against the majority of what you said, because yeah. it's just stupid. That's just not the, it's just not the case. Um, but you're right. And the ability, I, I see it the same way. It's either, it's either an acquisition channel where someone may have discovered your product. Actually, I think it's more inverted. I think a lot of people do this. I discovered your product through Meta. I mm -hmm. discovered your product through Google. I just want to see if Amazon has it so I can get it faster. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, we do it's we do so it. much work it's with Buy With Prime now because people are yeah. just like, I don't even I used to before Buy With Prime even came out, we used to make a button that said available on Amazon and we would just let people go straight to Amazon it's and we would just track it through attribution because I knew they were going anyway. Yeah. So like, screw it. Let's just make the overall experience better for them. And it it worked. And then of course Amazon caught on and now they're Mm -hmm. Stealing everyone's information, <laughs> which is fine. Yes, big brother, big brothers at work, man. You can't. Yeah. Get rid of I always them. say, play nice with them. <laughs> right, it's the eye in the sky, man. They, yeah, uh, exactly. I, but that's and that's where I think a lot of, but but at the same time, you know, even though, you know, so again, it also is nuanced. You know, if you're a subscription based business, then obviously acquiring them through an Amazon, but trying to get them, you know, once they go to your website and see that the subscription on your website is much cheaper. 
you know, yeah. operationally, I'm going to start trusting you. But where where I think you start to see more people buying direct to consumer and because of buy with prime, that's actually opening up a huge channel, but not everyone's using it. Unfortunately, if Shopify figures out if big commerce figures out a way to come anything close to Amazon's operational excellence, I think, I think you're going to start to see Amazon market share on the marketplace shrink. I really do. Oh yeah. If they can figure out like having their own, like, Hey, get it in two days sort of thing. And they, Oh my God, that'd be amazing. That's really where Amazon, I mean, Amazon wins because they've made, they've won in two places. They've won it with the cart and they've won with the delivery. Yeah. I mean, advertising on Amazon, I mean, Amazon still is like, it's, I mean, for all intent and purpose, man, it's not pretty. It's actually still ugly. And the PDPs, no, I don't like the PDPs at all. <laughs> at all. Like there's not much, like it's just, it's a, if you feel like you're at a rug bazaar, like genuinely, you know, and so, <laughs> And, and, and we just so we we also just left uh, um, unboxed a couple weeks ago, at least as the time of this recording. Yeah. And like the whole the whole conference was just Amazon like, oh, we're opening. Uh, you know, now you've got uh, TV ads you can do. You've got DSPs now going to start showing on these channels. And here's all the different things you can do. I go, man, you guys really realized that you ran out of advertising real estate. Oh, and yeah. If you want to keep growing, you're just going to put it off Amazon. And I find that most of those like DSPs and like that kind of stuff, like they're taking so much like view through uh, revenue credit that it looks like it's doing really well, which there's the brand awareness aspect and it should take some kind of credit. But like a lot of times, like we show clients those numbers, I go, OK, hold on. You're not rich. Let me explain what this yeah. actually looks like. That's right. It's exactly right, dude. And that's. And honestly, I mean, those those programs are really, I mean, genuinely saved for middle market brands. I mean, small business, yeah. just they, they can't afford that top of funnel spend no. at all, not even close. So, yeah, it's no. funny you say that because that's exactly exactly what's what's happened. <laughs> Real estate, it's become Manhattan. And now they're like, OK, let's go to New, New Jersey and try and find some more people. <laughs> exactly. And the PDPs are riddled with competitors. I'm like, this is so uh, stupid because so I'm not putting other people's products on my own website pdp so i gotta deal with this shit on amazon so <laughs> it's it's so true uh, so true but chris thank you so much for being on the show i know we kind of ranted several times there which makes great episodes so i love it, it. does make good episodes uh, man this yeah. is wonderful absolutely this is I'm beautiful on. yeah appreciate your time i'd love to give you an opportunity here let everyone know where they can find out more about you and of course more about gw yeah. So, um, you know, simply put, go to our website, gw.partners, you fill in the contact form. We do not pitch. We do not. We have very fruitful discussions like this, where we're all just we're, we're all trying to help each other. Number one. Number two, at the end of the day, if you're looking to really sell your company, let's make sure you have the right information. We have a lot of M&A partners that we send people to. So we're not a volume shop. Right. So for us, it's just about really good fit. And, you know, does it make a lot of sense? That aside, it's really understanding your business. And so by all means, let's just have a conversation so you have the right information, you know, when making your decision, when it comes to either selling your company or getting in the right hands of a good resource. Beautiful. Awesome. Chris, thank you so much. Everyone who uh, tuned in, please make sure you do the usual rate, review, subscribe, all that fun stuff, or head over to whichever podcast platform you prefer, or go to the ecomshow.com to check out all of our previous episodes. But as usual, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you all next time. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in to the Ecom Show. Head over to ecomshow.com to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or on the Blue Tusker YouTube channel. The Ecom Show is brought to you by Blue Tusker, a full service digital marketing company specifically for e commerce sellers looking to accelerate their growth. Go to bluetusker.com now for more information. Make sure to tune in next week for another amazing episode of the Ecom Show.